Bibles, we're going to spend some time in God's Word uh, this morning, and we're going to go to Mark chapter 15. I think we all know what it's like to have a queasy stomach. Maybe some of you are sitting here like, I got a queasy stomach. I didn't, I don't know what I ate for breakfast, but I ain't feeling very good. Or some of you are going to have a queasy stomach tomorrow morning because you'll eat too much tonight at your Super Bowl bashes. So just be careful about that. You know, too many wings, too many chips, you're not going to feel so great tomorrow. Uh, we can also get queasy stomachs when we're nervous or anxious. Maybe you're thinking, oh, I want to I wanna ask this girl out, but oh, no, it just makes my stomach feel so weird. And we all know what it's like to have a, a queasy uh, stomach. It's also possible to have a queasy stomach when you get disturbing news. You ever had disturbing news shared with you and you're like, oh, that just makes me feel sick to my stomach. The message today might make you feel sick to your stomach. Because in Mark 15, we finally get to the crucifixion of Christ. And it is sad. And it is horrible. And it is a result of human sinfulness. But here we have, while it might be difficult to hear, difficult to consider, here we have presented to us the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And while it might give you a queasy stomach, if you have a sinful heart which we all do by nature, we need to consider the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It's presented to us in his word. And it's something that God has written there for us to benefit from and to reflect on. So we've been talking about following Jesus now really all year. I think we started this sermon series way back in February or March maybe of last year. And we already did chapter 16 last Easter. So we're actually done today. This is our final Sunday in the Gospel of Mark. And we're looking at this and trying to figure out what does it mean to follow Jesus? And here we have sort of the, the heart of it all presented to us, this idea that Jesus paid it all. He paid it all. Big exclamation mark. He paid it all for us. This is like the eureka moment. But he did it because we needed it. Because of our sinful hearts, we needed Jesus to accomplish something that I can't accomplish for you, and you can't accomplish for anyone else, and we can't accomplish on our own. So it is might make you queasy, but it's actually good news for sinful hearts. And let's just bow in prayer and ask God to richly bless us as we go into his word. So Father God, this message, this book that we hold in our hands, help us to understand it. We want to understand it as best as possible, Lord. We also want to open ourselves up to being encouraged by it. Many of us just need to be encouraged by these old-fashioned gospel truths. Some, Lord need to receive it. They've heard it, but they've never received it as their own. They've never allowed these words to penetrate their hard shells and to transform them. Lord, get through to the people you need to get through to today. Soften those hearts, Lord. Open those ears. Get rid of the distractions. Father God, change us and transform us as we spend time together in your word, in Christ's name, amen. Six truths are in this text. Six truths I'm going to share these in the form of six lessons for sinful hearts. Six lessons for sinful hearts. Here's how the passage begins. Verse 21, Mark chapter 15. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. If you were interested in the economy of words... You could pretty much cut out the whole middle part of that verse, and you would just have, and they compelled a passerby to carry his cross, and that would have got the point across. But the writer chooses to include some details, and those details are there for a reason. Let's dwell on them for a minute. Simon of Cyrene, where is Cyrene? Cyrene was a town in northern Africa, roughly where Libya is today. Simon of Cyrene, he has a Jewish name, his name's Simon. His sons have Greek names, Alexander and Rufus. And so there is a bit of debate, is he a Jew or is he a Gentile? Chances are he was a North African Jew. We know that many Jews had left Israel, were living all along the top of the Mediterranean and countries we now know today as like Turkey, kind of Asia Minor. And many had moved into North Africa and it's, it was common for these, this diaspora of Jews to come back to Jerusalem to celebrate certain festivals. And we all, know, we all know they're celebrating the Passover in and around the time 
that uh, Jesus was crucified. So probably, probably we have a guy here who is a Jew who was born and raised in North Africa, but he's, he's come back. Now we have his two sons' names, Alexander and Rufus. This is probably rather important. And if it's not, my first point is not super meaningful, but I think this is probably what's going on here. What we know about Mark is that when Mark wrote the Gospel of Mark, his first recipients, you might remember this way back last year when we started this series, were the churches in Rome. You might think, oh, that's interesting. So he's writing from Israel, but the recipients are the churches up in Rome. So they receive this letter a few decades after Jesus' crucifixion. What other significant letter was written to Rome? Romans. And if you read Romans and you go all the way through to chapter 16 and work your way down to verse 13, you discover there in this long list of greetings that Paul greets who? A missionary, a believer by the name of Rufus, And he then says, Rufus' mother has also been like a mother to me, meaning a spiritual mother to me. So up in Rome, the church that received the gospel of Mark, it would kind of make sense. They must have known a couple decades after this event who Alexander and Rufus were. That would have been like, oh, okay, you're talking about that, Simon. It's Alexander and Rufus' father. Paul backs that up by mentioning another Rufus. What are the chances of there being, how many Rufuses in the room? Not a lot, right? None. Not a common name. Definitely not a common name for Jews to have because it was a Greek name. So chances are we're talking about the same person here. So what we have being presented to us then is this idea that Simon, whoever he was and whatever his circumstances were, became the father of some outstanding believers, And his wife was evidently an outstanding Christian woman as well by virtue of her spiritual impact as a spiritual mother of sorts on the Apostle Paul of all things. We need to know this because the specific act that Simon participates in would have been considered an incredibly shameful thing. We don't know if Simon was forced to carry the cross or whether he stepped up and volunteered to carry the cross out of sympathy for Christ. We just don't know. But what we do know based upon Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 23, is that anyone who was crucified on a cross was considered cursed by God. This is why the Jewish leaders pushed so hard for this specific kind of capital punishment for Jesus. They name it. Crucify him. Crucify him. Wouldn't it be enough just to say, kill him, kill him, put him to death, put him to death? No. They don't want him hung. They don't want his throat slit. They don't just want him run through with a centurion's lance. They want him crucified. Because this one who declared himself to be sent from the Father would now be under God's curse. So you can understand then that for Simon to carry that cross, that cross of shame, that cross that was associated with the curse from the Father would have been a shameful act for him. He's participating in a shameful act, an act that led to the Father's curse. Now, just as an aside, not super relevant to the message, but of interest to those of you who may read a lot of the novels or hear a lot of the challenges to the veracity of the New Testament, a lot of discussion about gospels that were left out or Gnostics or different early sects of Christianity that were silenced by the church. Uh, There was a group in the first century known as the Gnostics. And the Gnostics are an interesting group Their basic worldview was that anything you could taste, anything you could hear, anything you could touch, anything you could see, anything physical, anything tangible was innately evil. Now, we as 
biblical believers do believe that all of the world has been affected and tainted by sin. But there was a time when God created the world and all of its physicality, and he said it was good. Gnostics, no. Everything physical is bad. So because of this worldview, it was unimaginable to them that Jesus could actually and literally have a physical body. So they taught that Jesus was a spirit being who just looked and presented himself as having physicality, but actually didn't. So based upon this event, one of the things they taught in their literature was that Simon actually took the place of Jesus and God sort of blinded the eyes of all the listeners or the, the observers and it was Simon that was crucified on the cross. And that Jesus stood off to the sidelines laughing that he duped humanity in this way. Now that obviously is, um, the theological word for that is garbage. But it's something you may read or hear about if you happen to be exploring some of these uh, writers that are writing a lot about New Testament origins. Nevertheless, here's the first lesson that I think we can take from this text, and it is this. God blesses those that share in Jesus' shame. God blesses those that share in Jesus' shame. Simon shared in Jesus' shame. And whatever happened to his life after that, we don't know the details, It would appear that his sons went on to become missionaries of the cross. His wife was a godly woman that had an impact on one of history's greatest apostles and probably greatest missionary. God blesses those that share in Jesus' shame. In the New Testament book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 2, here's what it says about Jesus and the cross and its shame. It says he endured the cross, despising its shame. Despising its shame. A New Testament acknowledgement of the shame of the cross. But Jesus despised it. He stared it down. Because out of that cross, which represented the Father's curse upon humanity, Jesus actually redeemed it, and in that act, bore the wrath of the Father for you and I. So this explains why the gospel writers, take Luke, for example. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, what does Luke say to us through Christ? We are to take up his cross daily. Take up his cross. Why not something more generic like following his footsteps or adopt his message. Well, that language is in the Bible, but to take up his cross would have been understood by the first century reader. Oh, Christ wants me to actually share in his shame, to associate myself with his shame. Think about Simon. He didn't carry the cross after Jesus was resurrected. We get to do that. But he, he carried the cross not knowing what the outcome was going to be. That's gutsy. The scriptures, as we've considered what it means to follow Jesus Christ, clearly call us to do the same, to carry our crosses, to associate ourselves with Jesus, to be unafraid to say, I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. It's easy to say in church. It's easy to declare as a preacher in front of a group that's largely Christian. But can we not all agree to one common flaw that we have? There's at least one. And it's this. All of us have those times. It might just be nanoseconds. They might be weeks or months long. When there's this this natural shame that kind of creeps into our lives at times about being associated with Jesus. Isn't that strange? It's like, ah, I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. I'm passionate about my beliefs. I I would die for it. And then someone asks us a question. We're like, oh, do I really want them to know about my allegiances to Christ? Hey, let me just help you do a little evaluating here. As you consider the spheres of influence that you find yourself in in any given week, just ask questions like, 
Okay, at my school, some of you are elementary school students, some of you high school, some of you are post-secondary school students. At your school, do people even know that you're a Christian? I mean, you're, you're supposed to be staking your entire eternity on this. Are you carrying your cross? Now, I wouldn't necessarily expect for someone to know that you're a Christian who's only known you for five minutes. But if they've known you for five months, five years, are you ashamed of Jesus in your school? Do you take a stand for Christ? You're in the cafeteria. Is there that, oh, I don't know if I want to pray for my lunch. People might know I'm a Christian. They might think I'm weird. Do you pray for your meals in public? Or are you concerned about what other people think? We're not doing it for show. Those of you that are employed outside the home, do people in your place of employment know that you're a believer? I know you can't hijack your job description and use you know, 40 hours of your week to do missionary work. That wouldn't be fair to your employer. But do those people that you work with, that you chat with in the lunchroom, or that you have some free time to dialogue with, do they know you're a believer? Are you carrying your cross around them? Do you carry your cross into politics? Do you carry your cross into family relationships? Or are you one of those, and there's a lot of them, those Sunday morning only believers that's bold and filled with bravado for a couple hours on Sunday, but not during the week? Sadly, I've had opportunities to counsel young Christian couples that have grown up in churches and come from Christian families and who are preparing for marriage that have said to me in the process of considering family origins and how they were raised and what kind of homes they came from, well, my parents are Christians, but we just never talked about it. Just never really came up. Oh, we prayed at the dinner table. But my dad never had spiritually edifying conversations with us. My mom never talked about that. It just wasn't our thing. It wasn't part of the culture of our family. And that's sad to hear. Like if we're not bringing Jesus into our dinner table conversations or into our times with our children, our spouses, certainly I doubt we're going to be bringing it into the academy or into our vocational settings. But Christ has called us to carry his cross daily. And there's blessings that come out of that. Hey, one of our four pillars as a church is unafraid witness. Are you unafraid in your witness? Do you have the passion that Paul had? Ephesians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, he asked for the church. Hey, pray for me that words might be given to me that I might share the gospel boldly. Is that a prayer that you pray? How do we do this? Well, we, we need to be public about our faith and when I say public, I'm not just talking about going out and hanging out with unbelievers in a public setting. But we just need to be open about our faith. We need to be people who are marked by worship. People need to know who I worship. And it ain't the God of materialism. I worship the living God. Words, whether it's informal conversations, teaching opportunities, mentoring opportunities, preaching are we unambiguous about our faith? Are we people of prayer? When we say to someone, I'm praying for you, do we pray for them? When we're in public, do we pray? By the way, for those of you looking for evangelistic opportunities in restaurants as you're praying, seen it done, it's quite effective. The waitress comes up, you're like, hey, we're just about to pray, would you like me to pray for you? Most of them who want a tip will say yes. <laughs> but it may also open up opportunities for you to have a conversation about it. A friend of mine who pastors down in North Carolina has led people to Christ at the restaurant table. They're like, yeah, stuff's going on in my life. And they just start pouring it out. It's looking for those opportunities, learning from one another, witnessing to our faith, uh, both in public and in our families. That's verse 21. Next, we're in verse 22. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. We don't know where that is. Evangelicals love to claim the garden tomb as the location. If you've been to Israel, you probably have had your picture taken there. It's got to be that place. It just looks the part. We have no idea. 
Could be the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is now inside the walls. Could be some place we haven't yet discovered. We don't know. Golgotha means place of the skull. That might mean that it kind of was skull-shaped. It might mean there's a lot of skulls or bones laying around. We don't know. Probably better that we don't know because we'd probably idolize the location. I went to Israel back in 2010, and I remember saying to my wife, if I actually knew this dirt right here was dirt that Jesus walked on, I'd probably pick it up and eat it. (laughs) I know it would be adulterous, but I just felt like doing it. But that wouldn't be right. So it's probably best for us not to know the specific location to not be guilty of idolatry. But here's what happens at that place. They offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. Myrrh was used, among other things, as a painkiller. So they're offering him painkillers. Why did Jesus not take painkillers on the cross? For, if it were me, like, bring the aspirin, bring the Tylenol, bring, bring the myrrh. Why did Jesus not? Because here's lesson number two. Jesus refused painkillers to experience all of your rightful punishment. Jesus bore all your pain. He didn't side skirt it. He didn't just bear a little bit of it. He bore the white hot wrath of God for you. The scriptures teach this. And there's a lot of pain in the world that Jesus had to bear. In Romans chapter 8, verse 22, it says, all creation groans. The whole world is messed up because of sin. It's groaning, oh, when's this going to end? The cosmos is wearing down and running out. The world around us is messed up. Climactic issues, Bible talks about it, earthquakes, Floods, the physical world is affected by sin. And then there's us. Broken relationships, addictions, trying to mask or medicate away our pain, emptiness. Even you can be in a crowded room and feel absolutely alone. Where does that come from? We live in a broken world, emotional turmoil, mental confusion, anxiety, insecurity, fear. Spent a lot of time, spent another couple hours going through what a creation that is groaning looks like. And and here's how, there's two answers, there's two responses to the groaning that's obvious in our world. The godless, oh, they're very subtle about it. But the godless have approached this in our generation with medication, therapy, and through social services agencies, for the most part. Really, they have nothing else to offer but that. If we can fix... Social disorder in our culture, things will get better. How's that working out? We have so much more than they did 200 years ago. Is it actually getting better? Medication, because if you extract God from the equation, there's never a spiritual reason why whatever's going on in your life is going on. It's got to be biological. And because science is God, science can find a solution for you. Therapy. If I stare at my navel long enough or meditate or talk to enough people with earned doctorates in psychotherapy, my problems will be solved. These are horizontal fixes. They're all horizontal fixes. And they make absolute sense if all your world is is a horizontal world. They make absolute sense. Within the Secular framework within which we live, that makes sense. 
There's a problem, we need to fix it. There's a problem, it's within us to figure it out. I'm not suggesting that there aren't at times horizontal fixes that I need, but horizontal fixes are for horizontal problems. Oh, I just cut my arm wide open. I'm not going for counseling to my pastor. I'm going to the emergency room to get my arm stitched up. But if I don't need a hospital, I need God. Because so much of what we see in this world by way of mental illness and emotional turmoil and emptiness and anxiety and insecurity and fear are as a result of my sin or the sins that others have committed against me. Lies that I've been told about myself. Lies that I've been told about my purpose, my destiny. God or the absence of God. And these lies are so prevalent and weighty and common that we get burdened down with them. So we have people in our church today and they're, pardon me, but their very first line of defense against emotional problems is to a physician. That's their first place, not prayer, not the divine physician, not a pastoral counselor. Their very first line of defense is I'm gonna go find some chemical out there that'll fix my problem. Now, you're in a motor vehicle accident. Your brain gets damaged. You did drugs all through your teenage life. You fried something in your head. You were born with some sort of a disability. Great, go to a therapist. Go to a physician. But if your life is riddled by sin, sinful choices, sinful thoughts. There's no physician in the world that's gonna heal you. There's one healer and one alone. And it's not me, and it's not some guy in a white suit. It's the divine healer who specializes in healing the sins of the world through the atoning work of his son, Jesus Christ. You can be like, that is bunk, great. Let me know in six months or a year from now how your life's working out. Just continue on your secular path. Let me know how it's working out. But I can tell you this, we can tell you story after story, even in the life of this church, of people whose lives have been radically and eternally transformed as they've come to grips with their own sin or the sins that others have committed against them and they've gone to the divine healer and allowed him to do what only he can do. People in this church don't always listen carefully. I've had people come to me and say, oh, you don't believe in healing. You obviously don't listen to me preach or you're not listening very carefully. I've never said I don't believe in divine healing. I don't believe in divine healers. I don't believe that any one of us have the innate ability to heal other people. We don't have that ability. I mean, God could give it to us, but it's not from me. But I do believe in divine healing. Otherwise, why would we pray that people would be healed in our church? But I believe in one divine healer, the, 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 the divine physician who is Jesus Christ. And as we go to him in prayer and we pray for one another and we pray for ourselves and we come up close to him, God has a wonderful way of healing us through the work of Jesus Christ, physically, emotionally, socially, relationally. It's all spiritual in some way, shape, or form. Jesus died for the consequences of sin. So if you want healing, well, go to the divine healer and let him do what he does best. Here's the shameful act, verse 24, and they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. This fulfills Psalm 22, 18. It predicted it. That they would cast lots for his garments. This is a callous act. It's a callous act. Suppose that you were employed by your government to put people to death for capital crimes. Like, what'd you do this week? I executed three people. Well, tough job. What were you doing while you were executing them? 
Oh, my buddies and I, we were playing a game, raffling off their clothing. Pretty sick person. That's what they were doing. It shows the callousness of the human heart. There's this man on the cross. He's not even finished being crucified yet. And they're over here playing games. Who gets his underwear? Who gets his robe? Who gets his sandals? Here's a third lesson. Humanity is shockingly callous. Right place, right circumstances, it'd be you and me. Shockingly callous. It also explains why we don't always care about our own sin. And we don't always care about other people and the pain that they're going through. We're not alone in that. It's natural in a broken world. It explains why abuse is transcultural and timeless. It explains why murder is transcultural and timeless. It explains why lying is transcultural and timeless. It's been around since the beginning. It will be here to the end. No amount of medication, no amount of social systems, no electing of new governments will ever fix those problems. We can put checks and balances on them, but humanity will always find a way to sin. But thank God that God, through his grace, has given us hearts of flesh and no longer hearts of stone. The prophet Joel prophesied that that would happen when the Holy Spirit came and was poured out. And if the Holy Spirit is in you, God has sensitized you and made you aware of your own sin And presumably he's sensitizing you to the sin and pain of others and God is enlarging your heart for other people. Is God enlarging your heart for other people? Maybe you need to read 1 Corinthians 13 again. It's not irritable. It's patient. It's long-suffering. Ask God to enlarge your heart for other people. He, He wants to do that. He's given us access to that through Christ. The event itself is recorded in verses uh, 25 to 32. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right, one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha! You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. And so also the chief priests and the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He can't save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. What a load of lies. They'd already seen and never believed. When he was crucified and was resurrected, they still didn't believe. Don't let people convince you that if you can just provide them with tangible evidence, they will believe. That's just not true. Because the problem is not here. The problem is in here. People can see something and explain their way around it in many different ways. Those who crucified were crucified with him also reviled him. Hey, everything in this passage highlights human sin. Doesn't it? He stuck with a couple robbers that deserved it. Apparently, both of them were mocking Jesus. Thank God we have another gospel that tells us one of them became a believer. But it does use the plural here. So initially, they were mocking him. He was mocked while he was dying by just average people wandering around. He was mocked by the clergy. Everybody's mocking him. So you have all the stratas of society represented there. The soldiers, they're callous toward him. The guys on either side of him, on on other crosses, they're mocking him. The average people are mocking him, and the clergymen are mocking him. Everybody's doing it. They're all participating in this, and it just shows the depth of depravity of humanity. 
But even in his death, isn't it amazing that Jesus was a friend of sinners? One robber eventually is saved on the cross. Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. One of the centurions, look at verse 39, he gets saved, or at least it would appear, he makes a confessional statement. Truly this man was the son of God. We'll come back to this, but here's the fourth lesson. Jesus is a friend of sinners. Did he have to be? No. Like a fighter jet pilot, all power and authority, takes a missile in his plane. What does he do? Hits the eject button. Jesus could have hit the eject button any time. Any time. Here's, here's what it says in Matthew 26, 53. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? Yeah, I can do that. Jesus could have hit the eject button any time. And we would have been rightly consigned to an eternity apart from Christ. Could have done that. But he endured the cross for me. Say it, for me. He endured the cross for me. That's why he did it. Jesus is a friend of sinners. 33. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, in a language they didn't know, Eloi, Eloi, lemma, sabachthani. So what does that mean? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is overwhelmed in his humanity with your sin and your pain. He's overwhelmed by it. He's experiencing the full weight of feeling abandoned by God the Father. Eloi, Eloi, notice it starts with E-L, E-L, People couldn't understand what he was saying. I think think he's calling to Elijah. Maybe his speech was a little messed up too by virtue of the torture he'd been through. The word El, El, in front of Elijah, Eloi, is the short form of Elohim. So it means God. He's crying out to God. Why have you forsaken me? If you've ever studied Jesus' declarations or saying on the cr- sayings on the cross, they're all, it's a fascinating study. This one introduces us once again to the full and unambiguous humanity of Jesus Christ. And in his humanity, he experienced not only physical pain, but that sense of being crushed by the Father. And those words that he issued... Why have you forsaken me? Will be the words that everyone that continues to reject the Lord Jesus Christ will utter over and over and over again for all of eternity when they find themselves damned and absent from a relationship or a connection with the creator God the Father. But Jesus is issuing those on our behalf. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, He was made sin who knew no sin. Jesus bore that pain for you and for me. The fifth lesson then is Jesus was forsaken so that you wouldn't have to be, so that you wouldn't have to issue those words in hell for all of eternity. Why have you forsaken me? I'm alone, I'm empty, I'm cut off from the giver of life. Jesus endured that so that you wouldn't have to. I don't know how many of you read novels, but I'm sure you've all read at least one, maybe two, maybe a lot. Every novel begins in its own unique way, and it ends in its own unique way. If you don't have something unique, you're not going to have a novel published. It might be similar patterns to the storyline, but there's a distinct beginning, and there's a distinct end. Not so with humanity. Not so with humanity. The story of each one of our lives 
begins the exact same way and it ends the exact same way. And the beginning of the story is that God, while he created us perfect and good, we rebelled against him and we have been cut off from the tree of life and from the giver of life, from the garden of Eden forward. That's all of our story. The psalmist said we're born, we're actually conceived in sin. We're all sinners. The story of our lives. Who am I? Just another sinner. I have a son, just another sinner. He has a son, just another sinner. He has a son, just another sinner. The story of our lives is all the same. And the last chapter ends exactly the same. It's recorded for us in Revelation 20. We all one day stand before the great white throne of God. And God in his holiness judges us for our sins and we are consigned to an eternity apart from God for all of eternity, forever and forever. That's the story of our lives. Every human being, we're born in sin, we die in sin, and we're damned for all of eternity. But what Jesus does he doesn't say, hey, let me come and help you rewrite your story. Let me kind of help you to clean up your act. Let me help you to get things right. You know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Take a new path. Jesus never says that. Jesus says, hey, let me take my story and lay it over top of yours. Let my story become your story. L let me take what I have done, and at the end, what did I do? I actually conquered death and sin once and for all. Let me take my story and lay it over those final chapters of yours so that my story becomes yours. This is called grace. Now, if you'd like, I'll give you the next four Sundays off. And you can go next Sunday or Friday or wherever you want to a mosque. And then you can, uh, the following weekend, check out a temple. And the following weekend, go to a Christian church that's tossed the Bible. And then the next weekend, go to like a guru or Eastern mystic or something like that. And listen to what they say. Every religion, every group that supposedly is trying to answer life's questions are, are going to tell you the same thing. They're going to say, yeah, they're going to frame it up differently. Yeah, you got some sort of a problem. We agree with the first chapter. Some sort of a problem. You're disconnected from the divine or something's wrong in your world. But if you want to fix that final chapter and avoid judgment or condemnation or reincarnation or whatever it might be, what they specialize in is trying to get you to write the middle chapters differently. Hey, if you just do this... God will accept you. If you just kind of change your patterns of behavior, uh, you're going to be blessed by that. They're all the same. But biblical Christianity says, no, Jesus did what you can't. Jesus paid for your sin. And Jesus is prepared to take his story and lay it over yours. So when the Father looks at you now, he's not looking at Aaron Rock's sins and judging me because of it. He's saying, hey, I'm looking at the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And based upon Jesus' righteousness, I'm actually prepared to let this sinful man named Aaron into my presence and my heaven for all of eternity. And it ends in victory. Isn't that good news? It's great. It's incredible news. It's freeing news. And here we have some hope-filled verses in this text that kind of highlight the reality of this. This is not fiction. This is not like some hypothetical. Look at some of the people whose lives in the midst of this broken humanity were impacted by Christ. These are all people that had come up close to him. Verse 43, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of council. Ooh, wouldn't have expected him to be in the mix. We'll talk about him in a minute. Who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage, went to Pilate, asked for the body of Jesus. Notice he took courage. He wasn't shamed. He took courage. Pilate was surprised to hear that he would have already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen shroud. Maybe it was the shroud of Turin. You guys read about that? Who knows? Who cares? And taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out from the rock 
and he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene, ooh, wouldn't have expected her to be there. And Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. Okay, so you're telling me that we have a righteous remnant, and they're composed of a Pharisee who was part of a council that condemned Jesus, a centurion that oversaw his death, and a prostitute that used to sell her body for money. Yeah. Those are the people associated with Jesus after his death. We have this righteous remnant presented to us among the callous, murderous mockers that compose the majority of mankind. And these are people that came to the cross and took his body and laid it away because they had already encountered him. We're told in Luke 23 that Joseph had not consented to the will of the council in condemning Jesus. He was a righteous man among the unrighteous. Mary Magdalene, a seedy woman, followed Jesus. The centurion, not to mention the robbers we met earlier, one of whom was converted. All of these broken down people Adoring Jesus Christ. Here's lesson six. Jesus rescued lost people and he still does. I don't know all of your stories. I know some of you. But even for those of you that I know really well, I doubt I know all your dirtiest, darkest secrets. But we're sinful people. Some of you have done jail time for it. Some of you might have taken a life. Some of you might, well, be what we would call a sexual pervert. Some of you might be liars. Some of you have been unfaithful in the covenant of marriage. Some of you are incredibly stingy. Some of you are attention seekers. And then there's me. You want my list? See me afterward. You're going to need a while. We're all sinners. And the temptation is always to say, but I'm not as bad as Susie Rock. I'm not as bad as, but we're all sinners, justly deserving of God's eternal wrath, but Jesus rescued lost sinners, and he still does. Anybody here been rescued by Jesus? A lot of us been rescued by Jesus. Thank God for that. So considering this, as we are following Jesus, it's kind of hard to do by our own strength, but with God's help, it's simple. He's not trying to play games with you. It's not like dangling a carrot out in front of a horse plowing the field, never letting it eat of it. It's not playing games with you. Here's where it begins for all of us. It starts by accepting Jesus as our Savior. In order, in order to be saved, you need to first recognize that you are lost. You're a sinner. So you need a Savior. You need to acknowledge that. Stop playing games if you haven't acknowledged that yet. We're all sinners. We're all separated from God. Then we have him as the one we're going to worship. We sang it. We're lifting his name high. We want to lift Jesus' name high in all areas of life. And then we follow him as our example. How should I live? Well, I'll see what Jesus did here on that one. How should I respond? Okay, what did Jesus do? What should my priorities be? I'll check out Jesus on that. He's my example. So the biblical Christian who wants to follow Jesus has accepted Jesus as their Savior. They worship him as their God. And they follow his example. And we rely upon the strength that God gives in order to do that. But we never take credit for it. 
And we never look at other people as if I could never be like them. Hey, like I said last week, you're not as bad as you can be, but you're as bad off as you can be. And so we all need a savior.